Welcome back, y'all. I thought making Cerulean would be pretty easy. But no, it's not easy. It hard. Like I mentioned in the first video of this series, I want to use the original synthetic procedures for all the different pigments within reason. For Cerulean, this means we take a look at a publication from this guy, Albrecht Hopfner, a Swiss chemist who first synthesized what's commonly known as Cerulean in 1789. Here's the original document in all of its glory. I'll include a link to it in the description. Pause and read this if you care about the nuances behind translating old German articles. Pause and read this if you care what the original procedure was. I'm not going any further into it in this video because I was unsuccessful in my attempts and I intend to try again when I build a proper electric furnace, which is why this is a part one. I am not experienced in any way when it comes to electronics, so if any of you have an electric furnace build to recommend, please drop it in the comments. Anyway, I tried the 1789 procedure and only got black powders, then tried a similar procedure from the late 1800s that used potassium hydroxide to precipitate the mixed solution, but the same thing happened, black powders, which signifies to me that I only get tin oxides and cobalt oxide. I don't know if it's tin 4 or tin 2. Tin 2 is black, tin 4 is white, so I don't think it's tin 4 oxide. Cobalt 2 oxide and cobalt 2, 3 oxide are both black and brownish black, respectively. Trace amounts of something blue were randomly present, but I couldn't figure out the conditions to give me more than trace amounts. And this only happened when I torched them with a propane torch, so I kind of gave up on that. And then I begrudgingly moved on to the 21st century. Pause and read if you want. This is outlining what I'm about to be doing in the video. Basically, I'll be mixing solutions of cobalt chloride and sodium stannate, basifying with a sodium hydroxide solution, isolating the precipitate, and heating it with a propane torch. I calculated the amounts of cobalt chloride and sodium stannate to produce 5 grams of cobalt stannate. The paper I based this on was aiming to get nanocubes and used a horn type sonifier on the solution. And solution concentration is a major factor in nanoparticle formation, but that's not what I'm going for, so I made the solutions slightly more concentrated, except for the sodium hydroxide, I think I just screwed up the math, uh, to fit in my 1 liter beaker. First, I dissolve cobalt chloride in distilled water. Then I dissolve sodium stannate in distilled water. In the bag is what I made, and it looks similar enough to the reagent grade stuff in the vial, so I'm confident in its purity. Once both are fully dissolved, I add the sodium stannate solution to the cobalt chloride solution, which precipitates something pink. Sodium stannate is inherently basic, so it's probably cobalt hydroxide. The unmodified procedure used solutions of tin 4 chloride and cobalt chloride, which wouldn't precipitate upon mixing. I used sodium stannate instead of tin 4 chloride, the pentahydrate, because it was easier for me to isolate as a pure solid. Doesn't matter, it's all the same in the end, and I prepare the sodium hydroxide solution. Once the sodium hydroxide fully dissolved, I added it to the cobalt tin solution gradually. As soon as I add it, the color changes. Once the color persisted, I turned off the stirring to see if the precipitate would settle, but it didn't, so I started it back up again. The more of the sodium hydroxide solution I add, the bluer the precipitate becomes until it reaches its bluest when a little more than half was added. I could have stopped here, and that's what I do in my second attempt, but this time I decided to add all of it just in case. I checked the pH throughout the process, and it was about neutral once it reached that peak blueness. And then after adding the rest of the sodium hydroxide solution, the pH was highly alkaline, which, yeah, no shit. After adding all of it, I continued stirring for about half an hour, stopped to let it settle for another half hour, and moved on to filtration. During the 30 minutes of stirring, the color of the precipitate dulled to a dusty blue for whatever reason. The supernatant liquid passed through the filter quickly, but once the precipitate hit it, it slowed down considerably. 
A small amount of the superfine precipitate did pass through the filter paper, but it's inconsequential. It just makes the solution look cloudy, which it's totally clear once it actually settles. All in all, the filtration took three hours. Afterwards, here's the gelatinous filter cake. It looks like a lot more than five grams. I know. It's a voluminous gelatinous precipitate, and that's how they are. On the edges of the funnel, the color became more brown, which was supposed to be the color of the precipitate in the first place, at least according to the paper I used the procedure from, so that's good, I guess. I transferred the filter cake to a beaker containing 400 milliliters of distilled water to wash the precipitate from contaminants in the original solution. It wasn't breaking up as quickly as I would have liked, so I sonicated it, which did seem to help. Then I let it settle and filtered it again. This time, the filtration took about two and a half hours, and I was left with a less gelatinous product. After leaving it on the pump overnight, some cracks formed in the gel, and the color became grayer and browner. This time, I boiled it with acetone to both remove residual water and break down the gel's structure. Again, note the color change. This washing step made the filtration so much easier, it only took six or seven minutes. I left it on the pump for about half an hour to pull as much acetone as possible off the product, and it sort of worked even though it cracked instead of staying a proper filter cake. Now to dry it. The paper dried it at 70 degrees Celsius, but my air fryer that's in Freedom Units has the lowest setting of 180 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 82 degrees Celsius, so that's what I had to do. For whatever reason, I forgot to take a picture or video of it right after it came out of the air fryer, but there are two more runs after that I did record, and I do show what it looked like after grinding it down in a mortar and pestle. First, you can see the results of me trying to convert the dried gray precipitate to cerulean with a propane torch, which was slightly successful when it was in the form of the little nuggets, and a basically complete failure when it was a powder. This will become important later. Behind this, I'm redoing the exact same procedure I just showed, except I'm going to stop adding the sodium hydroxide solution just after the color stops becoming bluer. I won't stir it for 30 minutes or wait 30 more minutes for it to settle, as I was hoping the color would stay vibrant blue, and that's what I'd end up with, with no further steps other than filtration and washing. This didn't happen though, the color changed in the time it took to filter, which was a little under an hour and a half because I used my huge Buchner funnel. Then I repeated all the same steps, but some of one of the filter papers scraped off with the precipitate and made it all the way to the final powder. This doesn't really affect anything, it's just annoying and fibrous in some spots, and it burns off in the final step. Here's my third attempt with the reagent grade sodium stannate. The color of the precipitate this time is a little different at first, but it's the same as the others when dried. All the same steps, again, off camera. Here's a compilation of me blasting everything with a torch. I did the second and third run since the first run I had already blasted with a torch, and then I just decided to go ahead and torch the first run's first two attempts, the powder and the nuggets, again. This does make cerulean technically, yes, and I'm kind of technically successful, but for use as a pigment in a paint, it's unusable. I don't know how you would disagree with that, because there's no way I'm going to manually separate the blue particles from the black particles, grayish black, whatever, from either the nuggets or the powder, because that would be insane. I'm not entirely sure how much the fire hitting the precipitate affects everything, or anything, if at all. Even the original 1789 paper heated it in a muffle furnace, Muffle furnaces are specifically designed so that the combustion gases don't come into contact with what you're heating. It's heated externally, essentially. I already cracked enough porcelain with this torch that I'm using right here that I was not going to heat it from below. And I think that building an electric muffle furnace is ideal. You can just watch me blast this all with a torch. And every so often, I'll slow down the footage and show you the progress. I do break down the chunks every so often just to expose more surface area, but again, unusable as a pigment. Oh well.
And that's about all I've got. Except, I'm not going to have Cerulean Part 2 be the next video I do, because I want to extensively look into furnace builds so I can build the best one. Ideally, it's going to be a nichrome wire resistance heated furnace. I know for a fact that that won't get high enough for Celadon production, but it's a good start. It'll help me familiarize myself with furnace building and electronic setups in general. Next will be Lavender Town. It would be Vermilion, but that was my first video when I didn't even have an inkling of an idea that I would be doing this. Here's a link to the Vermilion video. It happens to be my most popular video. There's no way I'm making it again, especially, well, obviously not with the same procedure that I already showed, but especially not the original way, which is heating metallic mercury and sulfur in a metal tube. And then the vermilion that's produced is condensed because it basically sublimates. And actually, I said this in the original vermilion video as well. That's ridiculously dangerous, even for me. And I do stupid shit. So I'm not doing it again. I still have that vermilion sitting right in front of me, actually, as I'm recording this, like four feet away. I'm looking forward to this lavender one. It's not a synthetic organic chemistry video. It's really going to be mostly extraction and chromatography. So yeah, that's about all I've got. Thank you for watching. If you want to, like, comment, and or subscribe. It would really help me out. And I'll see you in the next video.